Hello, welcome back. I hope you are doing well. Today, this is going to be our third lecture that covers various movements coming out of the high Middle Ages within the Christian traditions. Today, we will focus on the mendicant orders, these monastic orders which emerged during the um, um, 13th century that came alongside and assisted um, the Catholic Church. So there's two mendicant orders. There's the Franciscans and the Dominicans. Both these orders um, participate in this innovative way of being a monastic community by leaving the confines of the monastic walls and going out to the communities to administer to the needs of the people. Dominican orders, the Dominican monks leave the cloister monasteries to meet the, meet the needs of the people in order to fulfill the role that was not always being met by the local priest, by the local clergy. The word mendicant comes from the Latin word mendicari, which means to bake. And this um, underscores this um, practice um, that was shared between the Franciscans and Dominicans. It was this practice of going out beyond the monastic walls with nothing nothing, um, nothing with them, but rather to rely upon the generosity of those who they ministered to. So in that sense, they were mimicking the teaching of Jesus when Jesus told his disciples in the gospel according to Matthew, to take no gold or silver or copper in your belts and to take no bag for your journey or two tunics or sandals or a staff for laborers deserve their food. And so based on this principle, right, of relying upon um, the assistance of the of those you were encountering, um, that's where you get the name mendicant form. It's this idea of begging, right? Begging for food or relying upon the um, good graces of those you encounter. Um, Francis of Assisi is the founder of the Franciscans which is um, one of the two major mendicant monastic orders. There's an image of the Basilica of St. Francis. Here we have the St. Francis Basilica in Assisi um, from the exterior view. So Francis of Assisi and the Franciscans. Francis, he came from a wealthy merchant family and he gave up his possessions to dedicate his life to serving the poor after hearing a, a teaching connected to Jesus' teaching from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 19, where Jesus, um, where Jesus responded to the young rich ruler who asked Jesus, what must I do, right, um, in order to, um, you know, be in right standing and follow you and be in right standing with God? And Jesus said, if you wish to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have a treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. So based on this classic teaching from Jesus, after hearing it, after it speaking to his heart, Francis gave up the, the benefits, the wealth that came from being a part of this wealthy merchant family and sought to start to establish a monastic order. In 1209, Francis Francis's rule would set up the guidelines, the rules and instructions for his monastic community was approved by the Pope in Rome. So that establishes officially his monastic order as it receives um, the approval from the Roman Church. Um, in addition, Francis is well known for being the first person to re receive the stigmata the stigmata is a term that refers to the, the wounds that one could um, receive on their hands, for example, that mimic the wounds that Jesus received when he was crucified and nailed to the cross. In this way, in this mystical experience, in this psychosomatic mystical experience, um, it's a way to relate to the sufferings of Jesus of Nazareth. Often Francis is depicted in iconography with animals 
in part because of um, the various stories that recount how he intervened um, when wolves, for example, bothered the villagers and preached to them and brought them into submission under Christ on behalf of the people. Also, it denotes his care for animals and his care for nature. So here, as we often see with Francis in statues, he's depicted with an animal, a bird, on his shoulder, which um, recounts his well-known love for nature. Francis of his, um, Pope Francis, the current Pope of the Roman Catholic Church, he's the first Pope to appropriate and choose the name Francis in order to honor the legacy of Francis of Assisi. Um, the Pope, um, like Francis of Assisi, um, has a heart for caring and serving the poor. So because of that line of continuity, he decided to choose Francis' his name um, to be his, um, his uh, ecclesiastical name as Pope. The rule of St. Clair, Clair was a female a female monk, a nun, who was friends with um, Pope, um with Francis of Assisi, um, um, Claire established his her own community, a monastic community for women for nuns, and her rule was approved by the Pope Innocent IV in twelve fifty three. So this is another monastic movement. We'll talk about women mystics in our upcoming lecture, but I wanted just to highlight that you did have female convents. Um, communities of nuns that were forming as well. In addition to the Franciscan movement, the second notable mendicant order is the Dominicans, who were founded by Dominic Guzman, who lived from 1170 to 1221. Dominic held to extended times of, of his, he practiced asceticism, spiritual training, through extended times in silence and fasting, and by abstaining from meat and avoiding comforts such as fine clothing and a bed. For the sake of the poor, similar to Francis, Dominic sold his possessions and joined a monastic house. The, the Pope approved of the founding of the Dominican order in 1216 and tasked this monastic order, similar to the Franciscans, they function as an arm of the church outside of the monastic walls and outside of the walls of the church. And so like the Franciscans, they were tasked with preaching and ministering to the people. So here is a um, Dominican monastery in Portugal. So places where they would have community, but again, they would leave the monastic community in order to meet the needs of the people. Um, and they were used by the Roman Catholic Church in a wide range of ways. Um, from helping to establish hospitals, to um, schools, and other um, kind of needs of the giving communities, but also, um, for example, in crusades. So in the Albigensian crusade of the early 13th century, which was supported by the French monarchy, in this particular crusade, the Roman papacy instructed the Dominicans to confront this her heretical movement known as the Cathars. The Cathars held to the dual dualistic teachings, and um, their, their teachings were called the Albigensian heresy because of their location in Albi, France. So this crusade, which the Pope supported in France, um, had the goal of eradicating this heretical group known as the Cathars. And the Dominicans and the Franciscans were called upon by the papacy to combat these heresies. So in some way they contributed or participated, right, in the eradication um, of these heretical teachings of, of the Cathars. So that will wrap it up for this particular um, lecture. It's important to note that prior to the medicant orders of the 13th century, um, this type of monast monasticism did not exist. Indeed, going back to the Rule of St. Benedict, which was published in 554, 540, in the opening chapter of this um, important rule, which provides in 73 chapters instructions for how to do community, community together. In the opening chapter, Benedict um, um, proves of, approves of two different types of monastic monastic life. One is the anchorite who withdraws into a cave 
or draws far away from society in order to find um, solitude and unity with God. So that was one way to be a monk. Another way to be a monk um, would have been, that was approved in the first chapter of the Bull of St. Benedict in 540, is to live within the confines of a monastery, right? So to live within the confines of a monastic com community. And that's why. Um, Benedict writes, of course, the rule of St. Benedict is to provide these rules um, for doing community together. And for centuries after, um, the rule of St. Benedict is used within a wide range of monastic traditions, which are collectively known as Benedictine um, mon mon um, monasteries. So he approves of two types of monks. One is the monk that's far removed from society or have no contact with society uh, in order to seek after God. And the other is one who remains cloistered within the walls of the community. What's interesting is in that first chapter of the rule of St. Benedict, um, there's one type of monk he does not approve of. And the type of monk he does not approve of is what he calls the Jeravog. The Jeravog is this monk that's wandering ar around in and out of society. The Jeravog is one that's not um, removed from society, like up in a cave, like Anthony the Great in the fourth century, or that one that's living you know, within the walls permanently of a monastic community. The Jeravog is wandering around, intermingling in and out of society. This type of monk is condemned within the rule of St. Benedict in the sixth century. And that remains the standard position until the 13th century, when you have this unprecedented thing happening. The Catholic Church recognizes the usefulness of having, having these monks who were dedicated to meeting the needs of the people outside of the walls of the monasteries. And so thus you get the emergence of the, these two mendicant orders, the Franciscans founded by Francis of Assisi and the Dominicans founded by Dominic de Guzman. All right, and so this is an important moment within the life um, of the Christian tradition in the high Middle Ages. And also should be noted, and you know, you have some great intellectuals that come out of these two traditions. So we mentioned, for example, Thomas of Aquinas during our last lecture on scholasticism. Thomas, Thomas of Aquinas was a Dominican monk. And so the, the monasteries of the high Middle Ages, they have a strong relationship with the universities, with scholasticism, which we talked about last class. Indeed, Anselm of Canterbury, who we talked about last class, um, and um, when we talked about his um, his um, theory of the objective theory of atonement from his work, Why God Became Human, he too was the abbot of a monastery. So there's, a, there's, a, there's lots of overlap between the university and the rise of scholasticism with the with the, the the monasteries and these two mendicant orders of that emerged in the 13th century. All right, so let's leave it there. Um, our final lecture on the High Middle Ages it will be on mysticism when we're going to focus on two female mystics. So we'll see you next time. Take care, and uh, thank you so much.